it's another day, so I figured why not add another place to the list. For the first time on these tours, welcome to the Sunshine State. And to start us off here, on the Gulf Coast, we'll be going through Tampa's Florida Aquarium. And on another note, the first thing you'd probably see here would be the Wetlands Trail. As far as I know, it opened with the aquarium back in 1995. However, apparently, it was last upgraded in early 2020. The trail is about a fourth of an acre journey situated underneath the aquarium's iconic 80-foot tall glass-roofed atrium, home to many species of live plants and animals that call this state their home. Along the way, we'll explore many environments ranging from the freshwater streams of mainland Florida to the dense mangrove forest, all the way down to the Gulf and the open ocean. So without any further to do, let's do this. Upon entering the aquarium, you are met with a set of escalators and stairs, and after taking them up to the second story, you'll find the underground spring, an environment replicating the many springs located throughout the state, which is actually two exhibits tucked away into the rockwork. The first and larger of the two is home to multiple and many sunfish, bass, and bluegill. But with them, there's also the Florida softshelled turtle and the Florida gar, who despite their sinister appearance, actually pose little to no threat to humans. However, it's said that the toxicity of their eggs can be poisonous if ingested. Anyways, now to the second tank, that's placed right above the guest path. But since all I saw in here was a single alligator snapping turtle, we'll be moving on. Following this and leaving the underground spring behind, as soon as you step under the arch, you are met with true beauty, the lush vegetation on both sides, complemented by the chirping of many birds, will eventually direct your attention to what's known as the spring-fed stream, which is actually two open-topped exhibits. However, the one on the right is much smaller. Anyways, in here, you'd find perch, carp, multiple species of killfish, and my personal favorite, the diamondback terrapin a smaller species of turtle native to environments such as the brackish coastal tidal marshes of the northeastern and southern U.S. It said that their name terrapin is derived from the Ingonquian word terrape, referring to their habits of living in neither completely fresh or salt water environments. Now the reptiles and fish aren't alone. Inhabiting the land portion of this exhibit are multiple rescued, blue winged teals, hooded mergansers, green herons, and the aquariums, ruddy ducks, a species unique due to their beak's ability to change color depending on the season, from a bright blue in summer to a much duller gray in the winter. And yes, since the atrium is completely open aired, those of them who still have the ability to fly can venture as they please. Continuing on once more, just around the bend, you'll find yourself placed in between two individual exhibits home to the more prominent residents of these wetlands. Beginning on the left, 
and yet again another murky tank, no Florida exhibit would be complete without the American Alligator, who throughout the 18 and early 1900s were hunted drastically for their skins and suffered great habitat loss. Then, in the 1950s, it was declared that their population had reached an all-time low of only about 100,000 individuals. Finally, in 1967, under the Endangered Species Act, the alligator was now considered in danger of becoming extinct in the wild. A combined effort led by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the local state wildlife agencies then stepped in to preserve this iconic species. Nearly 20 years later, in 1987, the Fish and Wildlife Service then announced that the gators had fully recovered and they were therefore removed from the endangered species list. Nowadays, they number at an estimated 5 million spread out amongst the southern United States. Following this, now on the right side of the pathway, is another split land and water design, where you can find the North American River Otter, who range all the way from most of Canada down to Florida. However, much like the gators, were actually hunted for their furs in the 19th and 20th centuries. Even despite this, they still continue to be affected by habitat loss and water pollution. Their habitat here in Tampa is complete with multiple logs, rocks, and my camera was just able to make out a replicated otter den. In the wild, they will often seek out abandoned burrows or empty hollows, including both above and underwater exits in the case of an emergency. These dens are used to protect their pups, who will remain there until they are fully weaned at about three months of age. Next up, nearly adjacent to this, is a single open top display depicting a patch of higher ground area that animals may use to seek refuge when the surrounding wetlands flood, known as the hammock, occupied by Gulf Coast, Florida, and free toed box turtles. The trail then leads you to another much more open space at about the midpoint of our journey. Somewhere around this area is another medium sized glass fronted habitat containing the Burmese Python, and yeah, you've probably heard of them before, but did you know that they actually originated in southeastern Asia? However, due to escapes and the pet trade, they eventually made their way into the Everglades, making them an invasive species to the south. Their presence in Florida has led to the severe decreases, especially in native bird and mammal populations, although they have been known to take down much larger prey like deer and even alligators. Because of this, many local government organizations have already started taking action to stop the invasion. Meanwhile, on another note, located across from the hammock is our first look at what's known as the Cypress Swamp, a split-level exhibit including both land and underwater views that blend perfectly into the dense undergrowth that we'll be seeing a little later on. Inhabiting the water are largemouth bass and bowfin, as well as my personal favorites, the abundant Barber's Map Turtles and Sewanee River Cooters. On the other hand, as for birds, 
I spotted the fulvous whistling duck, who during the breeding season will produce a horse-like sound. Now, one thing I forgot to mention earlier, if you happen to stumble across some bird poop on the floor, I'd definitely warn you to look up, where you'd probably find the roseate spoonbill, a medium-sized species of waterfowl native to, you guessed it, the Sunshine State, although they can also be found throughout the coastal areas of Texas, Louisiana, Mexico, much of South America, as well as the rest of the Caribbean, oftentimes known for their iconic, long, flat, spoon-shaped bills. Spoonbills will use these while shifting from side to side in shallow waters in search of small fish, crustaceans, insects, and other small aquatic animals. Much like flamingos, spoonbills too get their pink coloration from the carotenoid pigments that they eat. Past this and the Burmese python is a much smaller terrarium for the Florida ivory millipede. But next, possibly the face of the wetlands trail is the mangrove tunnel, a dense, and I mean dense, mess of mangroves that, based on my knowledge, has been growing here since the aquarium's opening. The forest surrounds you from both sides and of course, like most of the other exhibits, feature multiple above and underwater views of this ecosystem, including one that backs up to the cypress swamp that we just saw. In the wild, and as you'll soon see here, mangroves help protect and stabilize the coastline by preventing erosion, storm currents, and tides from damaging it. Not only this, but they provide a shelter for small fish and birds like the gulf killfish, mojara, pinfish, snook, Atlantic stingrays, wood ducks, both white and glossy ibises, and the redhead, as well as many more. In spite of this, none of them compare in size to the multiple red drums, a fish whose name is derived from their darkish red coloring and their ability to produce a drumming or croaking sound with their swim bladder and abdominal muscles. Oftentimes, in the wild, red drums can be found throughout the coastal areas of the southern states and are considered a prized game fish in the south. Other than this, they are also commonly known due to their distinctive black spot marking on their tails, which helps fool predators into attacking their rear rather than their head so they can live to fight another day. Being the large predatory fish they are, they can range from 20 to 30 inches in length. However, they actually prefer to feed on smaller fish, crabs, and shrimp. Now one last thing, despite being quite docile, if threatened, they won't hesitate to attack. And please, 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 no matter what you do, do not attempt to feed them or stick your hand into their territory. And based on what I've seen, you should be prepared to get an aggressive splash back. Although this would have been quite a fitting finale, our tour continues on to the Ranger Station, a small-scaled presentation area for families of all ages to enjoy. Again, moving on, past the entrance to Madagascar are the final four exhibits to go. First up, we'll be starting on the right side with a decent-sized terrarium for red, eastern, albino, and gray rat snakes, all of which followed up by the aquariums, juvenile American alligators, who, unlike their counterparts, we recently just saw, 
only average about six to eight inches in total length. In the wild, only about one third of all alligator nests will survive predators and flooding, not to mention an estimated number of only about four out of 35 offspring that will survive until adulthood. However, despite this, they don't really need to worry about any of that here in captivity. Furthermore, sticking to the right side is another glass-fronted habitat shared by both land and water-dwelling inhabitants. Above the water, I spotted the double-crested cormorant, who didn't want to be filmed, and the brown pelican, one of two species that will actually plunge face-first into the water in search of fish. But anyways, they'll get their proper introduction in a later episode. And I couldn't forget the long-nosed gar living just below the birds. They get their name from their elongated jaws and snout that is roughly three times that of their head. These jaws are littered with countless rows of sharp, cone-like teeth on either side, used well hunting where they will wait motionless until a small fish or crustacean passes by until ferociously snapping their jaws shut and swallowing their prey head first. Their scientific name, which I can't pronounce, translates to hard scaled, referring to their diamond shaped scales running all along their bodies. And our journey closes out with what's known as the Bay Shore taking up the entire left side of the path where the snakes, juvenile alligators, and gar are located. In here, you might be able to spot, give or take, nine species of fish who are native to environments spanning throughout the Gulf Coast, including a abundance of white mullets, multiple species of cowfish, and the very friendly scrawled filefish. In my opinion, a very peaceful ending to our tour throughout the Wetlands Trail. However, what I failed to mention was that you can continue this journey throughout the bay and eventually to the open ocean. Despite originally opening over 25 years ago, the Wetlands Trail has not only stood the test of time, but has and will continue to inspire the Florida Aquarium's annual 800,000 yearly visitors for many generations to come to protect and preserve the native ecosystems that thousands of plants and animals call home. Thank you for watching.